Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Mike Munger, professor of economics and political science at Duke University and a frequent contributor to the Library of Economics and Liberty. Mike, welcome back to EconTalk. It's great to be back. Now, Mike, in 1996, uh, a little over 10 years ago, a major hurricane hit North Carolina, as it sometimes does. It was Hurricane Fran. And you were there. You were on the spot and experienced a great lesson in in economic – the economics of everyday life. Tell us what happened when that hurricane came through. Well, Russ, I had grown up in Florida, and I was kind of used to hurricanes. But uh, when I lived in Florida, uh, all the first part of my life, we lived way out in the country. Um, When Hurricane Fran came through, I lived in Raleigh, the state capital. It's not a large city, but it's a a fair-sized city. And so the, the being in an urban situation without power and the sort of things that hurricanes do was a was a new experience for me. Um, Hurricane Fran had been it had been predicted that it was going to go a little bit east of us, and hurricanes in inland North Carolina, where maybe 120 miles inland, uh, normally all you're going to see is some wind, maybe some trees down. So I, I think people took it seriously, but not all that seriously. What was surprising about Hurricane Fran was that it it picked up intensity just before it hit the shore and just ripped Raleigh. Um, There were 120-mile-an-hour winds. In my backyard, there were 36 pine trees knocked down. It looked like God's own pickup sticks. We went out in the morning and just couldn't believe it. And as the city awoke on that morning in September, um, people were disoriented. We weren't used to the idea of being so totally on our own. Um, you could hear chainsaws here and then as people tried to cut their way out of their neighborhood. Almost every road was blocked with large pine trees. And I had a, a, a chainsaw that I had used on some small trees before I went out and tried to cut down uh, enough trees so we could get out of our driveway. And it started smoking out of the blade, not out of the engine. A little bit frightening. And burned burned out on the first tree. <laughs> so we we had no power. We had 36 trees down. One of them had hit the house a little bit, and we felt almost totally helpless. That that sense of a kind of breakdown of order, of chaos, um, was disturbing. I think people on the street walked out and just couldn't believe it. And I don't think we knew the extent of the damage. And were you, so, in were some ways, neighbors, this is an interesting. Go ahead. Were, were your neighbors out in their yards doing the same, trying we were, to do the same we're, thing? Normally, you know, you walk out in your bathrobe and you've got your cup of tea and you nod to your neighbor as you pick up your newspaper. In this case, it's 7 o'clock and we're out there at the end of our driveway looking at a tangle of trees in the road. And there's there's no way to get out of the neighborhood. You could hear chainsaws pretty far away. This is the sort of chaos that I think when people think about markets, they think, well, that's a situation where markets can't possibly work. That's a situation where only the government can help. And, you know, my first thought was, well, why doesn't somebody do something? Right. Get get some uh, – the Lone Ranger or, or some uh, agency, Lone Ranger-like agency to get this fixed. It's the equivalent of uh, of the major snowstorm. You're, uh-huh. you're waiting for the trees for the trucks to come and clear the streets. And... But there's, there's a lot of things that people are going to have a hard time doing for themselves at that point. But we also have a lot of basic needs um, that we depend on markets for. And so when you're when you don't have easy access to the kinds of goods and services that you're used to being able to get, um, it's disquieting. So the, the first thing we didn't have is power. And what that meant was that all over the city. People have freezers, refrigerators, maybe insulin, infant formula, and they're thinking, what am I going to do? I need some sort of way to keep this cool. Um, a few people had generators, but not very many. And if you, even if you had a generator, you needed enough gas to be able to run it. For the most people who didn't have generators, one of the main things that they felt like they needed right away was ice. And you had some ice in your freezer, but it was starting to melt. The question was, was there some way that we could 
get out of of our house and get ice. You want to take that ice, put it in a cooler, and keep your steaks and your insulin and your formula, whatever is the crucial necessities of life. Take the things that you just can't do without and make sure you can at least keep those cold. And this was a need that almost everybody in a city of 600,000 people, in an area of 600,000 people that had been knocked out of power, that we all wanted. Having experienced a similar experience, Uh, phenomenon here in Washington, D.C., and not being a very smart person, I remember having the brilliant idea of keeping the refrigerator closed. That was my first insight. Don't open the refrigerator. My my second insight, which was about 10 hours into the day, was, uh, hey, we've got coolers. Uh, We could go get some ice. And I foolishly uh, went in search of ice and and didn't find any, which uh, is, I suppose, what happened to anybody who could get out of their driveway at, in Raleigh that day. Well, some of the stores, which didn't have power, did have a little bit of ice. And the question was, what should they do with the ice that they have? Many of the owners, I think, took the ice home, which makes pretty good sense. You've, if, if you need the ice and you have some, you're not going to be able to get any more. Um, they were worried about how that they themselves might might get some. Um on the other hand, when you when you think about it, and I said, you know, we're we're worried, we're waiting for someone to to help us. Ice isn't very hard to make. All you have to do is freeze water, and if you have electricity, it's pretty pretty easy to do. And in cities and towns all around the affected area, they still had power and they still had water. So what you might expect was uh, all these people that did have ice could say, people in Raleigh need ice. I have it. I could take it to them. But relying on the goodness of people's hearts may not be enough. And in fact, nothing like that happened. That's hard to, it's a hassle. You got to get the ice there. You got to get through the, whatever challenges there are in getting into the city. You got to find people to sell it to. So what actually did happen? Well, I, I, like I said, I was initially kind of unsettled by the fact that we were without the infrastructure that makes our lives easier. But then I thought, well, all of these people that do have ice could bring it to Raleigh, and if nothing else, they could make a whole lot of money. And yes, it's a hassle, but the fact is I would have paid 20 or $30 for a bag of ice. I, I, I probably would have paid $100 for three bags of ice. I'm sure that I would have, because uh, we wanted to be able to have some of our food last for a few days. And it turns out there were people in Raleigh that were without ice for two weeks. And they would try to throw away the stuff that was in their freezer. I think this, uh, the, the, what, your decision about keeping it closed, first they kept the freezer closed in hopes it would stay cool, and then they kept it closed in hopes the smell would stay inside. Yeah, right. So the food very quickly went bad. Well, so the question is, why didn't people, for reasons of greed, if not for reasons of charity, why didn't hundreds of people bring ice into Raleigh? No, it's a classic arbitrage opportunity or a chance to import something into a region where that item is scarce. It seems to be an enormous profit opportunity, and you'd expect ice to flow from uh, where there's excess demand for it into the area where there's excess demand. So what what, but it didn't happen? Well, at the time, I hadn't realized because I hadn't studied it, but it's something that I've thought quite a bit about since, and I had occasion during this crisis to think about it. Thank goodness the Solons, the leaders of North Carolina, had foreseen a situation like this, and they wanted to prevent the citizens of North Carolina from being taken advantage of by unscrupulous sellers. So they had passed an anti-gouging law. And, uh, in fact, it was pretty explicitly called an anti-gouging law, and gouging is charging too much for some commodity. Yes, uh, we all have an idea. It sounds horrible, gouging. I love that word, you know. Uh, in fact, I hesitate to use it even in scare quotes. Um, oh, yeah, I'm but, against it. I'm against but, gouging. But on the other hand, it's such a nice word. Uh, I, I, you know, The only thing you really gouge, uh, I think, is sort of three things. You got you, There's price gouging. You can gouge someone's eye out, <laughs> and you can gouge out, I don't know, maybe like a piece of grapefruit. You know, If you got a half a grapefruit and you got one of those little sharp spoons. I, I've heard people say strip mining gouges. Oh, big there, you've got that mountains, too. But. You've got that too. But Almost none of the associations outside of the grapefruit are attractive. And I and, think the eye, the eye one is a common one. Yeah, and it's gruesome. Uh, I, I get a kind of uh, queasy feeling just thinking about it. 
So this idea that that sellers of an item would gouge sounds so horrifying. And so there's there's a statute in North Carolina, as there are in many states, uh, preventing that gouging. Do you have the wording there? I, I do. And the the question that I had wondered was um, how would someone know if they were violating a price gouging law? So let me let me just read it. It's written in kind of legalese. Um, it's a violation of the law for a person to sell or rent or offer, and then it goes on listing things, basically anything that's valuable, anything, anything useful, that's valuable yeah. or that people <laughs> want. And then it's anything that would protect, sustain life, health, safety, or comfort of persons or their property with the knowledge and intent to charge a price that is unreasonably excessive under the circumstances. Unreasonably excessive. So too much. Whatever that means. What does that? What could that possibly mean? More than they think it should. It means that they're being naughty. And in fact, I was thinking that perhaps what the um, the enforcers of this law could do would be, they're making a list. They're checking it twice. They're going to find out if you price gouge for ice. I love it. Well, I I Crowd's actually going I have wild. no idea how anyone except Santa Claus to de- could determine if sellers are being naughty. How much is unreasonably excessive in a circumstance where hundreds of thousands of people need ice and you have 10 or 20 bags? And and unreasonably excessive, if you did violate that ambiguous definition, what were the consequences? Well, it it varies a lot lot across states. In North Carolina, it could be a fine of up to $5,000 per instance. So maybe that would even be defined as per bag. Per bag, sure. Could be. So if you were wary of that law if you knew about it, uh, I guess you'd want to be on the safe side and not want to put at risk the chance of being caught gouging and uh, face that $5,000 fine. Well, the way to stay safe is to stay in Charlotte. Yeah. So ice that happened <laughs> ice that happened in, Star- in Charlotte stayed in Charlotte. So there's a, a large surplus. Other parts of the state had kind of stocked up because they weren't sure quite where the hurricane was going to go. So there were these stores bulging with ice. And they knew that they couldn't sell at anything more than what they'd paid for it, plus maybe enough gas money to break even. Well, they can just stay right where they are and sell it for that. So not taking a chance means that the ice stays where it is. Uh, to the detriment, presumably, of the citizens. Who well, the... but that's not what the law says. The law, after all, is trying to protect people against being charged a high price, which in effect means that the price of ice went to infinity or close to it. Since couldn't... there wasn't any, yeah. the price was so high that none of us could get it. It, it reminds me of this uh, glorious scene, one of the great moments of economics in the movie Coconuts, uh, early Marx Brothers film, uh-huh. where Groucho is is running a hotel and uh, doing a rather bad job of it, and his staff is very uh, upset at the way they're being treated. And he announces to them, he calls them all together for a meeting, and he says. Uh, do you guys want to be wage slaves? And they all say, no, they don't want to be wage slaves. And Groucho says, well, do you know what causes wage slaves? Wages. So I'm going to save you from being wage slaves. I'm going to stop paying you. So similarly, we're going to protect the people of North Carolina by not letting – not by creating a situation where no one wants to bring them the ice they so desperately desire. Well, and that's the, the, the difficult thing for me is to understand how someone could think that that was a good law. I was having lunch the other day with a mathematician friend of mine, and we were kind of commiserating with each other how when we said what we did, he's a mathematician, I'm an economist, we often had to stand alone at parties after we admitted what we did. Um, he said that he thought the explanation for why people didn't like our two disciplines was different. Mathematics is incomprehensible, he said, but economics just doesn't make sense. <laughs> now, it's true that economics doesn't make sense to a lot of people. The problem here is the only way to guarantee low prices was to allow sellers to charge high prices. Explain. Well, it seems like a paradox. But if you, if you tell sellers that they can't charge more than they paid for the ice, which is... In, desperately needed, then they're just going to stay where they are. Now, if if they think that they can make money, thousands of people would have brought ice to Raleigh. And the paradox is that if enough people brought ice to Raleigh, the price would have gone down pretty close to the level of what it costs to buy the ice in Goldsboro or Charlotte and rent a truck and bring it because oh. competition is going to drive the price down close to what it costs to produce. 
even though the first few people there might make a killing uh, because they have the only bags at first, the supply is eventually going to grow over time as this and, profit opportunity becomes known outside of Raleigh. And the speed of that adjustment will have to do with how much the government facilitates rather than retards the importation of ice. But what we had was the government threatening to prevent anybody from bringing ice in. So what I was doing was I, I had some blue tarp, like lots of my neighbors, and I'm trying to nail it up over parts of the roof. And you can hear bang, bang, bang um, from all over where people are, are trying to put the, the tarp over their roof. You can hear the chainsaws as people try to get out of their neighborhood. You can hear a siren now and then. But it was, it was a lonely kind of feeling. And it, as uh, dusk fell on that first night and there was no power anywhere, you really had a sense that we were pretty isolated and, we, and how much we depend on these niceties that become necessities in a crisis like that. But I, I have to say, Russ, that the system uh, had not quite broken down completely. There were at least four uh, young men in Goldsboro, North Carolina, who on that second day thought about it and said, you know, we can make a lot of money. And they probably hadn't read the statute uh, as as recently as, as you and I have. I, I think it's one of the most strange and, and bizarre phenomena of our phenomenon of our daily lives that Don Boudreau alluded to in an earlier podcast that we're, we're probably many of us are constantly breaking the law without realizing it because the law is so with the law is so complex. Don was making a distinction in that podcast between law and legislation. So we're breaking things that have statutes that have been legislated, although the law, the what is accepted practice might be something entirely different. The statutes on the books, there's so many of them and they're so diverse that it's uh, it's very easy uh, to break a law without uh, legislation, without realizing it being in violation. So these four four guys didn't – presumably they might have been taking a chance. They could have been uh, extremely entrepreneurial in that they knew they were doing something that was illegal, but – Perhaps not. Perhaps they just thought, hey, we've got some ice. Uh, we're in Goldsboro where everything is fine. Raleigh's in crisis. I bet we can make some money. And I, after all, had lived in North Carolina at that time for nearly a decade. I wasn't aware of this law. And if you read the law, like we said, it, it isn't clear um, what it would take to break it because it has to be unreasonably excessive. I, I, I was interested in that wording, like you said, the difference between law and legislation. I looked at um, all of the state statutes on price gouging and found that the wording of them, it, if anything, it made me even more confused. Um, the, the wording that people used is unconscionable, unreasonable, it can't be more than the old price, which I guess is fairly clear, but, but wow. <laughs> it can't be excessive. It can't be grossly excessive. One says it can't be exorbitantly grossly excessive. Um, none of those things do I know the difference between naughty and nice. But I, I'm not convinced that our gentleman from Goldsboro knew that this statute was even on the books. And I'm not at all sure that I want to attribute to them any kind of good motives. They may have said, people in Raleigh need our help. We must go. But more likely, they said, we can make a lot of beer money, and it'll be kind of fun. Let's let's drive to Raleigh. And so what did they do? Well, they got two small trucks, and they got about 500 bags of ice each, each of the two trucks. How far so, away is Goldsboro? Goldsboro is about uh, an hour and 15 minutes if you drive fast. And these young men were from Goldsboro, and everybody there drives fast. <laughs> so they were, this, this is NASCAR country. Uh-huh. So imagine these these young men driving towards Raleigh, and Goldsboro has a particular place kind of in North Carolina lore. It's kind of the border between central North Carolina and eastern North Carolina. And there's a kind of Yahoo element to the culture in Goldsboro, which I myself kind of admire because that's kind of the kind of people that I come from. But yeah, when, um, I, when, when you tell me they get in the trucks, I, the phrase he ya somehow comes to mind. <laughs> I can't, I don't, no, maybe, I don't know why. We're, we're young, we're yahoos. <laughs> yeah, why We've not? got chainsaws and we're headed to Raleigh. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a little, <laughs> and yeah, presumably they weren't drinking on the way. But anyway, they, they I'm, I shudder. So they have plenty the, of ice after all. So they got they got in, in these, and their trucks were 
What kind of trucks? They're refrigerator trucks. Okay. So they and got... they had, in renting these refrigerator trucks, they had paid a bit of extra money. Renting refrigerator trucks does cost you a couple hundred dollars. So okay. it, it's not as if you can go down to the Hertz and get it for 19 bucks for the day. So, so they, they'd spent, by their lights, probably a little over $1,000. So and they, they stock up. They got the ice. They got the trucks. They're on their way. And they... They they're 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 Yahoo's, not idiots. So they have chainsaws. They know they're going to have some trouble getting into the city because they've looked at the news reports. So they come to the outskirts of the city and they want to get towards the center of the city, believing rightly that that's where they'll get the highest price. Now, coincidentally, that also is the place where people need ice the most because they have the fewer fewest alternative opportunities of obtaining ice. So price and merit coincide here. So they cut their way. In it, it, several places, they, they had to cut their way through blocked streets. Being an economist, I, I, I can't help but think of the prince in Sleeping Beauty slashing his way through those thorns and thickets on his way to the, to the castle. But I suppose that's probably not a image that would come to most people's minds. But I, anyway, I'm not sure that's universal, no, particularly not. These, these, these two guys were not necessarily princes. Yeah, okay, so they, they make their way hacking along, uh, clearing a path. And, and clearing a path, by the way, for other vehicles also. So right. even though these guys were, even if they're just purely greedy, there are other cars that are going to use that passage. Unintended consequences of a positive sort. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, they, they, they get to a place where they think there's a lot of people with a fair amount of money and no power. And they pull over and start doing business. Now, I've, I have heard there, there are elements of this that are kind of an urban legend. I'm not sure. I talked to several people who either said they were there or said that they knew someone who was there. So I'm, I can't be as sure of the details. But imagine this. You've got 20 or 30 people waiting in line. It's hot because the day after a hurricane, a couple of days after a hurricane, it's brought all that tropical air up. And this is Raleigh in early September. So it's 92, 93 degrees. Everybody's hot. They're kind of out of sorts because they've been living without air conditioning and power for two days. They get to the front of this line after a, they're waiting in line five or ten minutes, and the ice costs $12 a bag. And some people say, well, that's too much. And the Yahoos from Goldsboro quite likely said, all right, get out of line. Step Here's aside. The, <laughs> yeah, that's it, 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 no problem, sir. Nobody's making you buy it. And they were right. Nobody was making you buy it. Go get ice somewhere else. Do without. It's up to you. So imagine that someone who just lived in an apartment, didn't really have much in their freezer, but had a lot of Bud Light that they wanted to keep cold, got to the front of the line, and they, were, they wanted two bags of ice to keep their Bud Light, which is a kind of beer. I know you don't drink, Russ, no, but this is a kind of beer. Is it? Um, wow. If, if I can get those two bags of ice, I go back, keep my beer cold in the cooler, um, I'm not going to pay $24 for that, but that makes sense from a kind of social planning perspective. Ice is too scarce to be wasted on keeping beer cold when there's people who need it to keep their insulin or infant formula or other things that they need cold. So that's actually right. Those people should get out of line, but they're angry, and they stood there with their arms crossed, and a, a, a crowd Listen, started to build up. I'm, I just want to let our listeners ponder this for a minute. Uh some of them might be pondering why I don't drink. That was a joke. I just want to say that for the record. I like, <laughs> and I like my scotch neat uh, without ice. Just, well, see, see, you wouldn't need ice. You would have gotten out of yeah, line also. I, I would have been fine. But here, here's what I want people to think about. Put yourself in that situation where you get to the front of the line and it's 12 bucks, Or you hear from a, a neighbor, hey, there's a guy over on the corner of such and such who's and, – and such and such street. There's a, there's a truck with ice. Oh, my gosh. You're so excited. You race over. Twelve bucks? Do you go a bargain, or do you say outrageous? Could go either way. Some people probably wanted to kiss the shoes of those guys for for selling it for a mere twelve dollars. Other people, like you say, were, were horrified and and offended that they would dare to charge twelve bucks for something that normally sells for what? How much? Oh, dollar seventy five, a dollar eighty. Russ, I think the fascinating thing, the paradox is that many people had both reactions at the same time. Mm -hmm. They said, yeah. That's outrageous. That's too much. Give me four bags. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because their need for it, in effect, was twenty dollars, thirty dollars a right. bag. They, they were ecstatic, but would have preferred to pay a buck seventy five. Well that, of course. That happens all the time. Yeah. I want stuff to be free, you want to be able to charge a lot. Markets somehow come to this process of narrowing down to what price will clear the market. And, and they, of course, this is a one-time 
event, more or less. These 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 Goldsboro uh, uh, folks didn't have a great deal of experience selling ice after a hurricane. Well, why didn't? It, I think it's an interesting question. Why didn't they pick fourteen dollars or twenty four? Right. They had to make their best guess as to the highest. I assume they decided. And we don't know exactly what motivated them. Probably a bunch of things: love, greed, anger, self-interest, excitement, thrills. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say if they thought they could have gotten a thousand, they would have charged it. I'm with you there, but I think they thought at a thousand they wouldn't sell very many, and so they just. I, I assume they picked the price that either would sell out the truck or give them the most money, which is almost always the same thing. Yeah, in this it, it, case. It, it, and, and and since they could change the price over time. If it turned out that people weren't buying at that, they, who knows? They may right. have adjusted it up or down. Absolutely. Um, I think they they chose the twelve dollars under the assumption that that was the best price for them, the seller, in terms of the revenue that they could expect from this ice that they'd brought in. So even there, it, it's not as if they could charge an infinite amount or a thousand dollars. They chose the price that they thought was best. Lots of people were buying ice at that price. They were angry. They were saying that's too much. You guys are pirates. Give me four bags. And let's stop here for a sec. I think some people assume that that in that situation where the price freely adjusts without uh, any reference to to, to an anti-gouging ordinance, if the Goldsboro guys are charging what they think the market will bear, that the only people who get ice in that world are rich people. And of course, some rich people are at the front of the line buying up ice. But some of the folks in line are poor people. Some of the folks who step aside are rich because all they've got is the Bud Light. And they don't really care if it's warm for a day or two, and they, they, don't, they don't want to spend 12 bucks. Some of them are, are rich people who have their own generator yeah. or two or three, so they're not in line anyway. And some of the people who are in line are poor people who desperately want to keep their insulin or their baby formula cold or in an urgent situation, and 12 bucks is not 12 million. It's nope. not like they, no one can afford it. Everybody can, can physically – everybody can afford 12 bucks. Yeah. They might choose not to. And the alternative is infinity. Right. They, they, the otherwise, they can't get it. So this price is far, far below the next best alternative. Of no well, ice at all. So what happened? Apparently – and this it, it's the, the fascinating thing to me is, is the question of uh, who was it that called the police? Someone called the police and reported this, and it could be someone who had bought ice. I think the interesting thing is it may have been someone who bought four bags, absolutely, got mm-hmm. home, and just started to fulminate about these, these pirates, these these terrible people Taking selling advantage. this at such a high price. So they called they called the the Raleigh police, and two apparently two Raleigh police cars with two policemen each, and an unmarked car, which may have been someone from the state, pulled up and started asking questions. Now, the yahoos from Goldsboro cannot have been happy to see the police, but we're not even sure if they knew what the statute was. But in any case, the it's police... Never, it's never, it, it, I was going to say it's never a good sign when the police show up at your store unless, unless you're selling donuts. Uh, <laughs> but, but I guess uh, they could have at first thought they're here to keep things orderly. Yeah, because there was, there was some grumbling, and it's quite possible that they thought well, there's you know there's a big crowd and they're they're here to do crowd control. Yeah, but not what's not meant to be. Well, the statute said unreasonably excessive, and um, in many states, um, what they the 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 price that the the maximum price you can charge, uh, they're they're more explicit. They say ten percent. So in in five above U.S. The, states, ten percent in addition to what the old price was. Uh huh. There's five states that say zero percent. You can't charge any more than the old price unless it's justified by cost. And our Goldsborians probably could have said, well, we had to rent a truck, you know, and that cost us an extra 50 cents a bag. It's unlikely it cost an extra $10.30 a yeah, bag. Yeah, they're, they're not going to make it. They're, they're not going to be able to justify it in terms of cost. So the police, serving the public wheel, in effect, denied all the people standing in line the right to buy ice because they closed down this ice selling operation, arrested the two yahoos, and impounded the truck. At both locations, do we know? There were four of them altogether. I only right? know of the one. I okay. only know I, uh, the only one that, that that I know of was uh, near a place called Five Points. I don't know what happened to the other truck. Again, there are elements of this that I, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were in the other one. They had to eventually <laughs> leap over a ravine and and into a 
a boiling uh, uh, waterfall of. But the police uh, came after him and they said, "Who are these guys?" Yeah, exactly. But so these. We know the one truck was impounded, and the story that I've heard was there are two parts to the story that are interesting. The story that I've heard first was that the truck was impounded, the truck was taken downtown to the police lot and turned off, mm. where, of course, all the ice <laughs> melted. Uh, the second probably. part that was interesting was after the police at gunpoint, in effect, had denied all these people standing in line the chance to buy ice. The chance to be exploited at $12 a bag. Yeah. They were standing in line to do it, and they had the money. The people clapped. The people standing in line clapped. That's the most interesting thing to me. Uh they applauded the vigilance of the police in protecting them from being gouged. Reinforcing the law. And these these guys charging $12, they were bad. They were bad guys. I think you probably could have gotten almost unanimous consent on that. Although, had I been standing in line, of course, I would have been angry because I would have thought, this is worth 30 or $40 a bag. To me, I'm losing the number of bags times at least $20, which is the extra amount that I would have paid. Please let me buy the ice before you close them down. I wonder also, I mean, what's interesting about it is I don't think there are a lot of um, uh, seminars for police officers on ex- on the meaning of the word excessive. So, you know, if you should think about this, getting back to this issue of law versus legislation, uh, in this conversation I had with Don Boudreau, we talked about how if you got pulled over for going 58 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour speed limit zone, you'd be outraged. Because you're only going 58, yeah. and, and the officer would never say, "Well, but the law is 55." Everybody knows that the law is 62 or 59 or 60. That the law, even though it says the legislation says 55, but the law is there's a cushion. In this case, there's the price that was paid for the ice, say a buck 75, by the the retailer. Everybody knows that some amount above that is quote okay, but at some point, okay shades into excessive. And how would you know? But the officers decided that twelve dollars was definitely there. Yes, and that, that that this is this is more than six times as much as the ice normally sells, and that's enough. Well, the, the the question of whether I can sell at a certain price is one that dogged retailers for a long time. Um, one of the, one of the Home Depots near my house, in order to get more generators apparently scoured over much of the East Coast, paid extra to have them trucked in, and then charged a 30% premium over the usual price because he, his claim was, he had, he had paid nearly a 50% premium, and he was actually trying to increase goodwill by getting people to come to the store and selling these generators below his cost. But because it was 30% more than they would have paid if they'd bought it two weeks ago, if they'd been foresighted, people were furious. People lined up out front of his store with signs and said, this, this, this is outrageous. He ended up almost giving away all of those generators, and here's the key part. He didn't buy any more. Yeah. <laughs> he made no effort to obtain any more. So what, what happened was people would drive to Virginia or to Tennessee and find a generator. By one or two. And, and that's right, yeah. and drive back and say, ha, I beat those price gougers. Well, no. Had the price gouging law not been in place, there would have been plenty of generators and there would have been plenty of ice. The price would briefly have gone up. Yeah, one of the th- Some people who bought it in the first day or two might have paid a little bit more. But pretty quickly, the price would have been forced back to the cost of production by competition. Yeah, well, One of the things that really depresses me is that uh, a lot of retailers uh, advertise the day after a crisis or a few days after a crisis that they would never, ever gouge. And of course, what that what that means is that they destroyed through either a voluntary decision or, I think, more likely the um, the, the force of the legislation. They've destroyed their um, their incentive to take a risk in the future. So, if you take a risk in the future and you acquire those generators, hoping that you'll be able to make a profit on them, uh, there's no there's no reward for bearing the inventory costs of holding these things in stock if the hurricane doesn't come through. And this is something you've written about a couple of places. It's actually not clear that if we didn't have anti-gouging laws, that's too many negatives. Let me try that again. If Suppose we didn't have anti-gouging laws. Mm-hmm. A lot of stores would probably not charge very much because they're worried about goodwill. Yeah, they'd be worried about the reaction that, that customers might have. But, but in fact... 
we actually want them not to be worried about that. We want them to charge the higher price. I think that's true. That allows them to bring all the stuff in. So even self-censoring, even self-policing, worried about reputation. Because like this this guy who the was investigated and was found to have been justified in terms of the extra cost that he had been paid, he regretted having done done it because the negative backlash was so great. So there's something more going on here than economics. We think things should be cheap. We think other people should get stuff for us when we're in trouble. Let me introduce another element, which I think really fascinates me, and I'm hoping to write about it in my next book using this particularly weird example. I don't think we've talked about it, you and I, privately, so I'm going to share it and see what you think. Uh Um, There's a really interesting distinction between a really small town where everybody knows each other and a larger city like Raleigh where people – you might know your neighbors, but you're not going to have much information about or relationships with people on the other side of town. An example I like of this is uh, in in the movie It's a Wonderful Life, and it's it's often – it's played many times on television in the last month. Yeah, I think I only saw it four times in the last month. Uh, I saw it – I saw it with my kids, as as I often do around this time of year, because I always get a kick out of it. Uh, I'm a real sucker for the uh, tearjerker aspects of it. So uh, in that movie, there's an incredible scene where where uh, George and Mary, Donna Reed and, uh, and um, Jimmy Stewart are about to finally get out of town. Poor, poor George Bailey he never gets out of town. He's always dreaming about it, and he's they're they're in the cab. They're so close. They're on their way to the train station, and there's a run on the bank, on the Bailey uh, building and line. And they have this big wad of cash. He Mary's says, got I it. I feel yeah. like a bootlegger's wife. Exactly. And 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 they see this run, and and Ernie, the cab driver, says, "That looks like it has all the makings of a run." And and George says, "Oh, I better check it out." And and Mary says. Oh, no, don't go, George. Very she, ever the sensible one. Yeah, she's, no, no, let's go. She's read the script. Yeah. She knows what's coming. So George, no, I'll be right back, he says, and he, he races over to the bank, and there's a mob there, and they all want their money out uh, because they're afraid there isn't going to be enough for them. And George patiently explains that, sure, they can take their money out. 60 days is the, I think, or 30 days is the waiting period, and he'd be happy to give them their money when they come back because they don't have the money in the bank. It's in... Billy's house and and Edna's uh, you know new house and so but they said now I want my money so they're, they're about to go uh, you know you're gonna have to shut down the bank to be a disaster declare bankruptcy be, Potter the evil uh, pot Mr Potter is going to take charge of the bank and at that very moment of course uh, Mary George's wife bursts into the store fist raised with the with the money from the honeymoon yeah she comes through and she says I've got two thousand dollars here and George instead of saying what the oh, heck? Oh no! <laughs> what are you thinking? Put that away. He's so excited. He grabs it and he says, "Okay, who needs money?" And the the first guy at the front says, "Well, I want to. I want. I want my. I've got two hundred and forty two dollars in this bank, and I want it now." And George says, "Well, you know, all all right." He get, counts out two hundred and forty two dollars, which is over a tenth of the total. There's about a hundred people in the bank. This guy is clearly a horrible person, taking quote more than his share. Yeah. And he, he says, oh, that closes my account. And George says, no, 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 your account's still open. Yeah. And then the next person gets in line and George says, well, how much do you need? Yeah, how much do you need to get by? Yeah, I said, well, $17, I think. And the next one needs 19 and then 850 and there he hugs a couple of them. Yeah. And, and what's going on there is that they're self-rationing. They're deciding – until this crisis abates, I don't need every dollar that's in my account because I look around the room and I these are my neighbors, and somebody here really needs you know one of the people's earlier said, you know my husband's had an operation, but he's out of work. We need we need money for food. Well, everybody would agree that that person yeah. should have more, and that process in a small town works really well, but in a large town where you don't have information, and by the way, the other thing that works really well is stigma. So that guy at the front of the line probably had to leave town <laughs> because after that, who wants to deal with him? He's a yeah. selfish guy. But in a big town, if you were at the front of the line and ice is a buck seventy-five a bag and you say, I'll take six, uh, and it turns out you just wanted to keep your Bud Light cold, but at a buck seventy-five, it's you know it's it's yeah. it's a bargain. Yeah, you'd pay two twenty. Yeah, so you pay a buck seventy-five, you're thrilled, and it turns out there's a guy at the back of the line who doesn't know you, you don't know that person. And that person's got the insulin that they have to keep cold, and they're they're out by the time that person gets to the front. And the guy selling the ice says, "Well, I'm sorry, you know, I sold six bags to some guy. I don't know where he lives, 
So you could start going around, knocking on doors, saying, you know, I need ice for my insulin. Did you buy any? And sure, somebody might give it up. But the beauty of that $12 is it tells everybody, unless you really have to have it, let it go for the person next in line. And it's such a powerful thing. It's really a very important Hayekian point that information is scarce. You don't know who's got the biggest demand for ice. We can't, unlike uh, uh, the case of It's a Wonderful Life, where essentially the whole town's in the room and we can discuss who really needs it and who can get by – in a city, you can't do that. you got to find a way to get the ice into the hands of the people who want it the most. Now, some of those people are, are the people who can afford it the most. They're the richest people. But a lot of the times, it's people who want it the most, who are willing to pay a lot. Those people are going to get the ice if you let it go to 12 bucks. And uh, if you tell them you can't charge more than a buck seventy-five, two things happen. One, like we've been talking about, there's no incentive to get ice into the into the area and certainly no incentive to bear costs. But also, there's just not enough to go around, and some people are going to do without, and who those people are are going to be random rather than the people who want to pay the most. Now, suppose I were a really good-hearted person. Suppose I were I was Jimmy Stewart, but instead of being in my little town, I'm in Raleigh, and suppose I come to – suppose these two guys from Goldsboro had brought it in, brought ice in, and they were charging it at, they were charging their cost. So they're selling it at $2 a bag. If I understand you, what I, Jimmy Stewart, ought to do is buy their entire stock at two dollars a bag, mm-hmm. and then turn around and sell it for twelve. So <laughs> an immediate secondary market should develop. So suppose the price gouging law says the original seller can only sell it for what they what what it cost them. Mm-hmm. Almost certainly, secondary markets are going to develop, and what might happen is your guy standing in the back of the line at a smaller scale, your guy that needs insulin from the back of the line, he sees you walking by with six bags. You paid two twenty for it. He says, "Hey, I'll give you five bucks for one of those." Right. Thinking he'll just avoid standing in line. So some sort of secondary market is always going to break out. But Jimmy Stewart, knowing that he doesn't know people, that he can't trust in that, would say, "The only way I can make sure that this ice goes to the people who need it most is to charge a much higher price." Right. And and we have to be careful here. I mean, I I make this uh, this kind of uh, slip all the time. The people who need it the most is a is a difficult concept. If you let the price go up, if you let the price be what the market will bear, the people who buy the ice are the people who are willing to pay the most for it. Now, whether those are the people who need it the most is a philosophical question, almost, I would say, meaningless and impossible to answer. The real question would be, would we be happy looking in from the outside – with who gets the ice in that world versus the first come first serve world. I almost agree with that. I, what the, the the point is, we have a number of different ways of rationing scarce goods. All of them are imperfect. So would would we be happy? Er, I don't think we'll ever be happy. We'll never say we've completely matched well, our resources to all their highest valued use. Right, and you might you might have uh, in any of these situations, you might have charities that buy up ice to give them to yeah. poor people who who can't af- quote afford it if it's you'll, you'll it becomes always extremely find paradoxes expensive. Paradoxes or contradictions. That, that I wish it hadn't happened that way. But what are the other ways of giving out ice? One way would be to um, just have it give it out by lottery. Right. We could we could everybody gets some chance of getting ice. You all stand in line, and the ones who come in first get it. Um, we could have uh, just people line up. If, if suppose that they had sir. charged two dollars and twenty cents, the line would have been a mile long. Well, that means that a lot of people aren't going to get the ice at that price. Again, secondary markets are going to develop, um, and nobody's going to bring the ice in. So that also is a bad. Right, those two factors, I think, are the the key thing to, for for our listeners to to remember. The real problem here is there's not enough ice to go around. People want ice, and there's there's not enough available at the uh, at the old price. And so if you think about the think about the different lengths of line, the Goldsboro people charge a buck seventy five, the price th- that they literally paid for it, the line's extremely long. If they charge three dollars because they don't want to gouge quote too much, the line's still very long. If they charge twelve dollars, it's still pretty long. In all three of those cases, they still sell the same amount of ice. They still every, the number of people who get ice is the same. It goes to slightly different people. It goes maybe. to slightly different people, maybe. Although, as you point out, the secondary resale market might affect. Yeah. It might be the same people ultimately who get it. But the other point is, 
is that the amount number of bags that come in from Goldsboro is not the same in all three cases. No, because if you let the price rise, there's a line of trucks. Coming exactly. In. There's not a line of people. There's a line of trucks. And that's the thing that I think is hard for people to see. You talked earlier about the paradox, and it's hard for people to appreciate and to foresee that if you say we're not going to let you charge twelve bucks, we're only going to let you charge a buck seventy-five. Nobody gets gouged, but very few people get ice. And but nobody blames the politicians for not keeping order. The paradox that makes economics so hard to understand is the only way to ensure availability and low price is to let sellers charge high prices. Because that creates the incentive for the other uh, suppliers to come in and, and uh, eventually push that price back down. Quickly. So People let's, are greedy. They'll do it fast. Let's go back to your scene uh, uh, of, of this uh, urban legend or uh, <laughs> cinema verite. I don't know what I'd love to – maybe some of our listeners were there at the time. I'd love yeah. to hear from them, um, and maybe they'll swear affidavits or some huh. other form to keep the story straight. But uh, uh, this moment that, that you um, that you mentioned where as the police haul these miscreants away uh, and impound their truck, taking away the ice uh, that people applauded is just such a fascinating insight into – human nature and the challenges we face as economists and economic educators. So they applauded. And were, when I ask people... What are, were they do, thinking? Do, well, when, it's basically the same question. Do you favor anti-gouging laws? And they do. Sure. 80% or more favor anti-gouging laws. And it, this just made it much more concrete for me. I'm used to thinking of anti-gouging laws as people are confused. They don't really understand. Um, but, you know, given a chance... No, they would be upset. That's not true. They just don't like the idea of scarcity. They think there should be more. And now, that takes the form of saying, I wish the price were lower. They don't understand that the the price is something that reacts to the amount. It's not what uh, it, it, people are, even if they're trying to rip them off, they're not going to be able to. If price goes up enough, there will be a line of trucks coming in. Well, let's take let me let me give you a different interpretation. I, obviously, there's no right answer here. I don't know exactly what people are thinking, and I think even if you ask them, you might not have a good, a meaningful interpretation. Oh but, yeah, because they're they're trying to justify. You're not sure. Yeah, it's hard to know what people really are meaning in that situation. But so, if, let me give a different possibility. Maybe what people are saying is there is scarcity, but I'm in, I'm in, I'm in dire straits. Uh, I don't have power. You come in here and you charge me twelve bucks. If you were a decent human being, you would have charged a buck seventy-five, or even maybe two, or two and a quarter, or even three. But once you get into the twelve range, it's clear that you don't care about me. You only care about yourself, and you're trying to make money at my expense, and that's wrong. Because the only variable that you control is price. You have a fixed amount of ice, you're going to sell all of it. But by charging a higher price than I think is fair, you're trying to rip me off. You're just extracting yeah, you're just extracting resources from me. Now we all understand that everybody would prefer in line would prefer a lower price to a higher price. That, that that's not what's interesting here. I think to me what's interesting is this idea that says I think part of what people have in the back of their mind is something like this. If I were in your shoes if I were selling the ice instead of buying it, I would never do that. Of course, most of the people in line wouldn't have gotten in the trucks. That's the problem. That's well, they'd, the they'd, they'd have looked at the news and said, damn, that's a shame. Yeah, that's a shame. I, see, I think the hidden – something's missing here. What's missing? You know, It's easy to say, well, people don't understand economics. Obviously, that's part of what we're trying to get at here. But what part of economics don't they understand? I think part of what they don't understand is that – the supply isn't what it is regardless of the incentives. In their mind, look, they're already here. It's so a truck, the, yep. The right thing to do is to charge 2 bucks or 2 dollars they're, they're probably right in the sense that if they had a truckload of ice, they would sell it at a low price. If, if they had it right this moment, they're not thinking about why did this truck of ice appear right. in Raleigh. And I think uh, even more uh, – we could even be more uh, generous and say that I think some people would say if I had ice, I'd give it away. Mm -hmm. Which might be true, and you would too. You'd give it away to your neighbor if you came back from that um, from that ex if you had gone to that to that ice truck, bought four bags for twelve dollars a piece, and you and as you came home, found your neighbor uh, sobbing in the front in the driveway, 
and you ask why, and say, well, my, my child's my child's hungry, and our formula is going to. I got a baby infant, yeah. and, and and the formula is going bad. Here you go. You say ice. take a bag of ice. Yeah. And if and if and if your neighbor said. Well, how much was it? And you'd say, you'd say, never mind. Yeah, yeah, that, you, you'd say, you go. take it. You'd never say, well, it was twelve bucks, and then I had to wait in line. My time's worth a certain amount. We all understand that as 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 decent human beings, as people who do care about other people, we don't just care about ourselves. We don't charge the market price in every situation, and this is a distinction that Hayek makes very powerfully in uh, the book, The Fatal Conceit. When he talks about how we have to treat our family differently than we do strangers, and a neighbor is in between. A neighbor is not a stranger, but it's not our family. But still, just like we wouldn't charge our our, our kids for the ice that we brought back from that store, we probably wouldn't charge the neighbor in that setting yeah. either. Well, but, our, our mutual friend Tyler Cowan has written a fair amount about this, about how in some cases it actually might be morally wrong and indefensible because the, the defense of price gouging of, of, of price gouging to me is that it will elicit a supply response. But suppose you live on a barrier island, everything's closed, and you're trying to decide the price to sell um, plywood. Mm-hmm. People want plywood. There's a hurricane coming. They want to cover their windows. Um, most people are probably, if you're a small hardware store in a small town, you're not going to charge $200 for each piece of plywood, even though in some sense the market might bear that. Now, you can make a reputational argument, you know, I care what people think of me. But it might also be that I care about these people. These are my neighbors. Absolutely. And, and I... we're all in this together. So, but, but the point is, in that situation, you wouldn't need a price gouging law. That's correct. It's the circumstances where price gouging can elicit a supply effect, and only then that we're saying that it's illegal. So what we have is uh, it seems like a, a paradox. First, Raleigh has announced that anyone who tries to sell ice at more than its old market price is going to be arrested. Second, there's a huge shortage of ice, and we're depending on the government to bring it in. So my claim is that, by and large, the second is caused by the first. The reason there's a shortage is you're not allowing people to bring in ice for a profit. But it's certainly true that in many circumstances, I myself, most people, wouldn't come close to trying to to charge what the market would bear and would do our best to help other people. But if I said – if you're sitting in your home in Raleigh one day and you read about a hurricane uh, coming through Goldsboro, most of us wouldn't go out and take the initiative to rent those trucks – Fill them with ice, take them to Goldsboro, and charge a dollar seventy-five as an act of goodwill. And here's the kicker: suppose that a few people did that. Some but people what? might, by the way. I want to say, by you know, just as a just as a footnote, in the in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people went down to New Orleans to do voluntary work for free. And, yeah, and that's, a lot did. And that's that's a glorious thing. I have no, yeah. no pro- we have no. Pro- I assume you have no problem with that. Well, but but wait, there's a Burger King in New Orleans. That offered a five thousand dollar premium for anyone who would work, and said that they would give them a housing allowance. Now I want to know why those workers were not arrested for price gouging. Yeah, they. Um, and and I think again the key point is, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, a lot of wonderful people volunteered to go help others who were in distress. But if you pay them, you get even more. And the the Burger King, a lot of the fast food restaurants. People were desperate for some place where they could eat that was safe and healthy because there are real problems with sanitation. And so a number of restaurants tried to open, but they couldn't get any workers. The only way they could attract workers was to pay them a large premium and a housing allowance. Now, that's price gouging in a sense. But reverse, all it really yeah. does is reflect the underlying scarcity of labor. But right. the same thing should have been true for people who were going to put on roofs, who were going to cut down trees, all sorts of goods and services. You'll get even more if um, you, you let people charge more. And here's the thing. If, after all those volunteers come in, I come in and I'm greedy and I want to sell things at the market price, if the market price is still high, that means that there aren't enough volunteers to do the job. We need more. We need even more. The only point. way to accomplish that is to let prices rise. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I interrupted though. Did you want to say something else about goals for our? Well, actually, that was the the the, the same point was that um, the one way for me to find out if we're getting enough ice is to look at the price. Right. And since these guys were able to sell at twelve dollars, we still don't have nearly enough ice. We need more, not fewer, of these yahoos. 
So let's let more of them come in. So so long as because people people would say, well, the government should provide it. Well, the government provided whatever it did. Some ice was provided by the government. If if that happens, or volunteers, good-hearted people, if that happens, then at the end, I look at the market price. It's still much higher than it was before. That means that we need the the market to do even more work. Yeah. Um, and although we're talking about North Carolina in 1996, uh, in the aftermath of Katrina, people were arrested in, uh, I think it was Mississippi, may have been other states, for bringing in lumber and other items that they wanted to sell at, uh, they were selling above uh, the market price of the previous market price, yeah. the, the price before the Up, hurricane. Above their cost. And uh, these people were going through an enormous amount of inconvenience and, and some out direct outlay, but mostly inconvenience of time to go do this. And some people are good hearted enough to do it for free. Most people aren't. Most of us aren't that that good to help strangers in that at that level. And um, they were arrested for their pains. And the evidence that there wasn't enough of that was that that market price was still so high. Yeah. That's the thing that surprises me. If, if if I can go in and charge a high price and people will pay it, then there's clearly not enough. We, we have to find some other way of getting more of that stuff. But let's admit, after hurricanes, after natural disasters, there's all sorts of other things that go on that really should be against the law. Fraud, misrepresentations, different kinds of extortion, economic holdup, all of those problems are real. All I'm objecting, all you and I are objecting to is price gouging. Of course, fraud should be illegal, where I tell you I'll put on a roof and then I do it with substandard materials. Or I don't we're not up. objecting yeah. to any of those things. <laughs> Being illegal, correct. Yeah, that, th those things should be illegal. They already are. We have different laws to cover those. Now, what's interesting about this, too, and I, uh, you and I teach economics and use I use these examples all the time. I I still spend a reasonably large part of my intermediate microeconomics class talking about price controls and people say, well, that's an interesting historical example from the seventies with gasoline and, and lines. But we have price controls now uh which are I think in many ways much worse, which are these anti gouging ordinances or statutes, because they are ambiguous. With the price control, at least sometimes you at least know what is breaking law and what isn't. In these, uh, the attorneys general and also the, the local police have lots of power to be arbitrary in what's considered gouging. And it is a form of price control. It's just administered at the state level. We've seen it for vaccines. We had a vaccine shortage two years ago. Uh, there, many people were threatened with jail if they sold the vaccine at above the quote mark the fair price. Yeah. Yeah. And as a result, long lines formed, and people actually, again, it's not common, but people died, old people who are waiting in line for a flu vaccine two years ago in the winter, dropped dead in line from the from the discomfort of being having to stand for so long. Yep. Uh, it was a horrible thing. Yep. Uh, President, we had this ridiculous situation where President Bush was begging people, instead of using prices, to get people to get out of line because it was too expensive. He had to beg people to not get a vaccine if they weren't at risk, which of course is an ambiguous phrase, which yeah, just, has no just, meaning. You, use your own discretion. Use your own discretion, which, didn't, which doesn't work very well and is also ambiguous. It's a, it, so I just want to remind our listeners that if you've taken an economics course where you talk about price controls, we have lots of implicit price controls at the state level. There is continually talk of putting various kinds of what would be essentially price controls on pharmaceuticals. Uh, which well, the is vaccine very, example is a fantastic one. You're exactly right. But the pharmaceuticals, you know, a lot of people who complain about the high price of pharmaceuticals uh, want to change that by just simply forcing companies to charge less. Yeah, they prefer lower prices. Uh, but as we point out here, the incentive effects of that on future innovation are really what we want to take into account. And uh, that's what's easy to forget. Well, Mike, thanks for a fascinating discussion out of your personal life. Uh, okay. my, my guest today has been Mike Munger, professor of economics and political science at Duke University. 
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.